All right. Testing one, two, three, one, two, three. Perfect. And. Pretty boy. Oh, he's such a pretty dog. Yeah. <laughs> You're pretty, honey. Oh, he's so pretty. So pretty. Is it itchy there, Dick, or are you just dirty? Did it see that, Dickie? Are you dirty? Are you dirty boy? Dirty. Oh, he's so dirty. Dirty boy. Dirty, dirty dog. Dirty boy. Dirty, 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 dirty. Good boy. Such a good boy. Such a good boy. Okay. Duke, stop licking. No more licking. You're going to hurt that paw. Yeah, you're all clean. Good boy. Good boy.
Oh, we're just about to get going here. All right. Testing one, two, three, one, two, three. And we are off and running, gang. Hey, welcome. My name is Bill Harvey. Good morning to these Thursday weekly webinars. Grab your cup of joe and let's go. This is the eight steps to success of the sales success phase of our Automotive Sales Academy program. This step is the roadmap to converting every shopper every time because shoppers buy from salespeople that follow a system. And that's because your competence generates confidence and that is why they buy. Average ordinary salespeople think a system is predictable, boring, rigid, and that shoppers won't buy because of your system. That is just not the case. Shoppers love your system. When you follow a system, they get it, they appreciate it, and carry on. So I am Bill Harvey, for those of you that don't know me, and this is our brand new program, all part of the Sales Gladiator program, but now the Automotive Sales Academy, and this is something I've been working on all summer long in cooperation with a couple of others and collaboration, I would say, and it's been, I'm really excited about it. So I hope you're really in a quiet place and you're only focused on me and you want to be sure to be taking notes because you simply cannot absorb this much information this fast and expect to remember it, to leverage it in those clutch moments. Now, I know you must be fretting about the rise of interest rates, but keep in mind that nothing is new because that's me. Yep, right beside that truck in front of 10.9% interest, proudly advertised to help save the customer money. And customers purchased all through that time period as well. Focus on your process, not the elements out of your control. And that's what we're gonna be doing today. A win it, winging it sales style approach will have you succumbing to those external factors such as interest rates that you cannot control. When you land your shopper in the right vehicle from the beginning, you'll sell automob any automobile in minutes. Now, just before we start, allow me a moment to familiarize everyone with the platform and set the room. If you're new to Zoom or an expert, please bear with me. Now, it's Zoom is really easy. If you see my lips moving, yes, there is sound. You want to click yes, join with your computer audio, assuming that you're reading these subtitles as I am talking. Now, if you cannot hear me, Look for the microphone icon in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. If it has a red line, strike through your speakers like your microphone is muted. Then click on the speaker icon and that should eliminate the red stripe and you should be able to hear me. To be less disruptive to those around you, you want to consider joining with headphones or earbuds. This definitely suggests that you are not available and in a meeting, specifically in this particular case, online. Now, if the app did not go to full screen, you can do so by clicking the upper right-hand corner and click full screen so that you can see the whole thing and enlarge it. You may want to put up a sign on your desk as well that you are in a meeting or on your office door that you are unavailable. But as always, we want to be ready for those friendly buyer interruptions. Position your pointer at the bottom of the screen and the chat bar will pop up where you can send me a message. If you have a question, you can post that to me and ideally to everyone in the seminar and in any class setting. Simple rules here apply of being respectful, courteous, and polite. If you see a question and you know the answer, feel free to contribute in the chat window. Now, if you'd like to give me a thumbs up throughout the seminar, throughout the program, you can certainly do so by clicking on the reactions and that's found down there at the toolbar. You'll see that clapping hand and the, the thumbs up and the heart and the, the laughter of crying or the surprise face and, and of course the surprise and delight, the celebration one. You can click on any of these reactions to gain your response. And if you wanna passively sit and just observe, that's okay too but you can't possibly expect to get the same results as someone else who's really engaged in the program will get. And you wanna use these reactions when I suggest that you do so, recommend or pose a suggestion. 
Now, in the last step of the Dynamic Buyer Odyssey, we talked about the Sales Gladiator Code of ASK, ask, in other words, meaning your attitude, your skill, and your knowledge. Now, you know everything starts with an attitude from that session. And good or bad, capable or not, happy or sad, determines your attitude, winning or not. You know your greatest skill is perseverance. And you also know that with knowledge, formal or informal, the learnings will help you avoid the pitfalls of mistakes. And you've also come to realize that your voice, body language, and content are crucial communication elements to influence buyers' decisions. Subtle gestures can turn on and off shopper interest because you don't get a second chance to make a great first impression. Now, the eight steps to success is the second step of the first phase, as indicated here and circled. The eight steps take the guesswork out of not knowing what to do with shoppers, ensuring everyone buys every time. The eight steps position you as the trusted authority to buy from. Now, from a high-level perspective, these are the eight steps being welcome, interview, product presentation, demonstration, trade evaluation, and purchase consultation. These steps should be on your mind throughout any interaction with your shopper. As ordinary average salespeople cut this process, skipping steps, and then they wonder why so few shoppers buy even in this particular market. We're going to talk about this. So are you thinking, why is following a process really all that necessary? Well, it's really quite simple because forever, the following statistics that I'm going to share with you, which lead to the process, have not changed regardless of any economy. How many customers do you think will communicate with you on a daily basis? Text me in your response. How many customers do you think communicate with you on a daily basis? This is regional specific. This is market and demographic specific. But how many customers do you think you'll see on the lot, text, text in, email in to you, call you on the phone? Excellent. Great. Four, five, one. Three, I'm looking at my second screen here if it looks like I'm looking away from the camera. Fantastic, dynamite. Thank you for that. This is the significance of converting every shopper every time. Because on average, what my research has revealed to me by asking that question a lot, you'll speak to, see, or email two inquiries per day. I don't know if that's good news or bad news for you. There will be days that you communicate with four, eight, and 10, but on average, throughout the cycle of the calendar of the year, you'll see two or communicate with two people per day. So what we need to keep in mind is this fact is the second most important financial decision that people make next to buying a house. That's the fact. Second greatest decision next to buying a house, financially at least. Therefore, this decision is never made in jest of purchasing an automobile or a, or a power sport product. And it's never made in haste. As much as they say, my car died. I, I need to get one right away. It's hunting season. I need to get an ATV. It's, it's snowmobile season. I need to do this right now. It's not really ever made in jest or in haste. Now, it doesn't matter what you sell, automobiles, power sport, or RVs. To afford one of our products, our consumers have to accept a significant commitment of payments or after-tax spending the whole amount on after-tax dollars. Now, the following questions are a result of a study that I conducted with my students as the professor at the Automotive Business School of Canada. Studying consumer behavior, we learn how and why shoppers buy. So, how many shoppers will tell you that they're just looking? Text me in your response. How many shoppers will tell you they're just looking? Most, <laughs> all of them, 100%. <laughs> Not surprised by that. It's kind of why I'm giggling and laughing, looking at the text chat here. All right. Thank you for that. Studying consumer behavior, we learned how and why shoppers buy. 93% said that they open with just looking. 
That means essentially everyone. So you're right. Everybody, 100%, all of them. Anytime a shopper comes into the showroom, they're probably the first thing out of their mouth or even top of mind for them is let's gather the information we need. And then we're going to go home and think about it. And when we're ready to make this decision, we'll go ahead and do so. What we want to keep in mind when we meet these shoppers that say, I'm only looking that they've actually visited 80 plus web pages. Now we gather that intel from Google and the magnificent plethora of analytics that they have for us, specifically the study that they did called ZMOT, that zero moment of uh, zero moment of truth. So 80 web pages over the course of at least six months searching for their next automobile or significant purchase. We discovered that if one vehicle receives 20, there we go, 20 picture views or more, there's a really high probability, like 80% or more, that that particular vehicle will sell in 72 hours. That means by the time they reach out to you, they are more than ready to purchase that automobile. Now, salespeople in general have been accused of being less than sincere. Not all, but many of us. Average ordinary salespeople that follow a winged approach tend to exaggerate, tell non-truths, and answer questions with unsupported conclusions. And that is the primary reason why some salespeople are tarnished with that brush of not being truthful. The, I guess I really want to get to the point on this one. On in, inexperienced, unskilled, winged type of salespeople, point blank, do lie to customers. They lie because they get caught ill-prepared and feel inadequate. So I'm not going to soften that blow. We got to say it what it is. And if you're one of those, quit doing it. There's no reason for doing so. So let me ask you this. How many salespeople would admit they know their product knowledge? Text me in your response. How many salespeople would admit they know their product knowledge? Twenty percent, half. Everybody should, yeah, unquestionably. Everybody should know all of them. Excellent, Carolyn. Thank you. Text me in your response. Even if I'm going too quickly, don't hesitate to text in your response. I can see your your response on my second screen. So, let's see what our our results revealed. 55%, in other words, just over half of salespeople, and that's who we were interviewing, the you, the salespeople, admitted to knowing their product. The rest of them use lame excuses, blaming too many models, configurations, and combinations. This is the second greatest financial decision that buyers make in their life. Is there any excuse for you not knowing your product? And the rationale, the customer's know-it-all is weak and untrue too. Customer research tells us shoppers think that you know the secrets and that the factory has told you. And you know everybody loves a secret or insider information, right? Let me ask you this. How many customers actually want to drive your product? How many customers actually want to drive your product? Text me in your response. I'm going to carry on with the presentation here. Go ahead and text in your response. How many customers actually want to, to, to drive your product? The answer might surprise you. And I got a quick story on that for you. Let me ask you this. If a shopper came into your showroom on the hottest day of the summer to buy a snowmobile and you sell snowmobiles, would the average ordinary salesperson pull that snowmobile out of the shed, fire it up and tell the customer to give her a go on the grass? Think about that for a minute. Would the average ordinary salesperson go to the trouble and the expense of pulling that snowmobile out of the shed and telling the customer, give it a go on the grass right there? It's the opposite season. It's July. It's the hottest day of the year. Now, this is assuming that you live in the Northern Hemisphere. I don't have anybody in this classroom in the Southern Hemisphere, such as Australia and New Zealand, which is their wintertime right now. Now, I share that story with you because it's true. And I know the salesperson that did that. And she's sitting in the room with us, Rebecca. And she did that and sold a snowmobile on the hottest day of the year. That's fantastic. Without that product presentation demonstration, I think it would have been a real challenge for that buyer to say, let me think about it. 
my goodness, there's six months, at least five months away from being able to ride it. She sold it because the interview, presentation, and demonstration, all part of this eight-step process. Now, I want you to remember that as we go forward. Over half will willingly want to drive your product, like only 52%. So that really begs the question, why doesn't everybody, I think a couple of, yes, some of you said everyone, 90%, uh, some others, excellent. Thanks, Rebecca, appreciate that. Many shoppers know subconsciously the demonstration drive moves them from a logical state of mind to an emotional state of mind. The drive makes them feel like they just got to have it. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. I'm certain that snowmobile owner did in the summertime. And you know, when they say, I had no intention of buying that you did exactly what the process does. And that converts shoppers to buyers from throttle snappers to owners, from tire kickers to owners, from lever squeezers to owners, especially with snowmobiles in the middle of the summer on the hottest day of the year. Now, let me ask you this. How many salespeople have a planned demonstration drive route? How many salespeople, text me in your response. How many of you have a planned demonstration drive route? And four corners around the block of your dealership is not a planned demonstration drive route. How can you expect any shopper spending this much money to fall in love with your product driving around the block five, four or five turns? I'm talking five turns by pulling into your dealership again. To afford your products, the, the, the customer has to commit to six, seven, eight, nine years. I've watched shoppers buy a computer and a smartphone take more time than that. Now, if logic enters their mind, it will overshadow the emotion of trying to elicit. So half of you have a route, um, a little loop for ATVs and side-by-sides, excellent. You know, the whole point is to demonstrate what the vehicle is capable of, right? And just by saying, you know, take it out and give it a shot, see what you think. Well, if they're worried about breaking it and having to own it because they broke it, they're not going to take it on a decent drive. <clears throat> Pardon me, excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. Only 65% of salespeople surveyed said they actually have a route. Now, can you believe that? Wow, 65%. That means you've got almost a one in two chances of selling a customer because you did take them out on a demonstration drive. Let's look at it from the buyer profile perspective that we covered in the last session. Aggressive buyers are fine with a five minute drive. They're okay with that four corner drive because they're aggressive, assertive, no time for anything. Friendly buyers will let you go all day long. And so you've got to control that and contain the demonstration drive. The listener will do whatever you say. If you, if you told them to drive into the lake because that's the GPS told you to go that route. And we've heard those stories before with news, whether it's true or not, they'll do it. And of course, the enthusiast has their own plan. What I'm getting at is you want to have two or three demonstration drive routes so that you can really highlight what the vehicle is capable, be it um, automobile, four-wheel drive, two-wheel drive, SUV, car, side-by-side, -side, utility vehicle, snowmobile, ATV. What you want to do with your demonstration drive, especially with the rise of four-wheel drive, and I'm talking about the last decade. I'm not talking about just over the pandemic or the last two years, but the rise, the prolific rise of all-wheel drive, I don't believe a lot of buyers really understand what it's capable of and what it can do. And if they're buying in the summertime, like our friend that sold a snowmobile on the hottest day of the year, it's as simple as this. When you're out on your demonstration drive, tell the customer to put it in four-wheel drive. And then ask them if they feel the difference driving along. What do you think they're going to say? What is the difference going to be? Nothing. Absolutely nothing, right? And that's perfect for you because now you can say to them, that's what driving in the wintertime on slippery road surfaces of snow and ice will be like. Oh my gosh. Now the shopper experiences that emotional connection of effortless driving in perilous conditions. Oh my gosh. Simply because 
of your simple demonstration drive suggestion. Dry road, 900 degree weather because it's summertime. Put in four wheel drive. You notice the difference? That's what driving in the wintertime is going to be like. That's the power of an orchestrated demonstration drive. So with all this effort put in the plan route, how many shoppers will convert after the demonstration drive? By convert, I mean like buy. That, that's what conversion is all about, right? Go from shopper to buyer. How many will convert? Text me in your response. How many will convert from shopper to buyer following your demonstration drive route? All of them, 50%, uh, great, 60%, closer, 20%, um, uh, yeah. The bottom line is, judging by everybody's response, you're all saying the same thing. Everybody's going to, or there's going to be conversion. Pardon me. It's not going to be 100% because nobody said 100% other than one person said everyone. So let's have a look. What did survey reveal? 65%, two-thirds will convert from shopper to buyer. And this is why a winged approach in automobile sales is super difficult to pattern success. Meaning, what are you doing right that you can copy and continue to do so and get even better at? This is why the eight steps are so successful and the process just simply works. The demonstration drive is so effective at moving shoppers from a logical state of mind to an emotional state of mind, it cannot be debated. The only exception is when your inventory, like we've been experiencing lately, is light or even absent. More on this to come. So let me ask you this. How often are salespeople followed up? Pardon me. How often do salespeople follow up with shoppers? Pardon me. How often, and I'm, I'm asking that question to you, text me in your response. How often do you follow up with your customers? Every time, great. 90% of the time, 50% of the time, 42% of the time. Okay, good. Sounds like everybody follows up and I would expect that. that I'm, I'm fully aware that that would be the case. However, I do believe for a number of salespeople, and again, my survey reflects this, I've got the data on it. I do believe for a lot of salespeople, the phone receiver, the thing we put to our ear, weighs a thousand pounds and they never, they're never able to pick it up. The computer keys on your keyboard require a thousand pounds of force, which means it never gets done. You'd have to hit it with a hammer in order to be able to type out a message. That's ridiculous. If your experience with follow-up is bad, then you're likely doing it wrong. Let's be candid about that. Shoppers expect you to call. They expect you to email them. And some of them even expect you to visit them. When you don't, you disappoint them, and they express that rather liberally. Now, three years ago, we did a, we did a study, and the study revealed less than 10% of salespeople follow up. And what I'm finding disappointingly right now is that is still the case. And you got to be sitting to yourself saying, why? why? Why aren't people following up? Well, it's simple, fear and rejection. Today, I believe that follow-up is low because of demand and inventory, right? If, if you just wait for the next person to come along, because your inventories are so lean and so thin, you just have to wait for a buyer to show up. And that is ridiculous. I would imagine little is changing. Follow-up is best, obviously, we have found with sold traffic, but sharply drops off to being completely forgotten. You are totally forgotten at the six month point of ownership. This is precisely why ordinary average salespeople struggle their entire career and lives. They're not top of mind with shoppers and buyers, so their pipeline is never full. Now my students and I found the easiest way to fill your pipeline instantly is with your customer's family. And our research showed us this. 48% of a customer's family is ready to buy as a result of your shopper's purchase being your customer. Case in point, a friend, 
that I consider a family friend kind of guy and a fraternity brother from school oversees the operations of several brands leading a dealer group. And we talk routinely and regularly. Now I share this with you because I teach thousands of students annually. But when someone asks me, like one of my friends or a neighbor or a colleague or anybody at all for that matters, ask me, where should they buy a vehicle? The name that rolls off my tongue is his. And why is that? Because he's the guy that I talk to the most. Do you really get that? You wanna to be top of mind with your customers so that when somebody says, hey, where do I go to buy a vehicle? What's my trade worth? I'm thinking about replacing my car. Who can I trust to go do? You wanna be the person that your customers, that were shoppers, now buyers through you, think of to go and get another vehicle. Now, a frequent question that I hear is, Bill, how long should I be working at the dealership? And as we come out of the pandemic and get back to normal hours and normal shopping routines and life goes back to, let's just say, instead of pre-pandemic, let's just say 2019 experiences. Well, sales is a numbers game. Being prospects, all the, as many prospects as you can talk to, equals sales. But the assumption, I think, is incorrect that the more you work, the more people that you'll sell. And I don't believe that that's the case. There are certain times of the year that do require extra effort, but not all year long. If this is you, then step nine will be a significant interest leveraging apps and technology to work smarter, not harder. But you should prepare yourself for at least 38 to 50 hours a week, spiking to 60 periodically through the busy months. Time off and rest, and this is the reason why I bring this up, time off and rest is necessary and healthy. You think faster. You handle objections quickly. You provide solutions with creativity. Exercise and sleep is absolutely necessary, as well as balance time with family and friends because they need you too. So take a break at lunch. Go for a walk. Reflect, contemplate, and meditate. And you don't have to sit with your legs crossed and in a quiet place and eyes closed and listening to some great meditation music. And I don't want my, the, my tone of voice to be condescending to that. I think that's an excellent idea and a, and a great plan. But you can meditate by sitting on a park bench, watching the, the birds fly by and the squirrels feeding in the grass and thinking about what are all the things that I need to do? What are all the things that I can do better? What is it that I really want to accomplish and achieve? Your body and mind must be in balance to fuel your business. So now, as we saw earlier, these are the eight steps to success, and you'll learn the sequence in order, but keep in mind that a customer can start you off out of sequence. That's why this map is cellular. If the customer wants to drive the vehicle, in other words, experience it first, do so. Put them in the driver's seat and take them down the road. If they want to know what their trade is worth before ever seeing or driving your product, do so. The more flexible you can be following your process, the more likely that you're going to be able to facilitate it routinely. And that's the secret over and over again and again and again. Now, the map works in the showroom as it does on the phone. Let me show you how. I want you to read those read the do's and don'ts on the slide. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. When you're done, give me a reaction, a thumbs up, right? And tell me what you thought. Read the bullets on the slide, the do's and the don'ts. Give me a thumbs up when you're done. Excellent. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Excellent. Give me a thumbs up once you've read all those. Step number one, you want to welcome the customer into the showroom with, and, and if you do this now, may I help you? Or it's a nice day and I'm pleased to meet you. That's crap. Don't do that anymore. Skip that gobbledygook. That's an average ordinary salesperson's greeting because they're winging it. Shoppers want your best price, not a generic half-hearted greeting. 
even the greeter at Walmart does a better job with average than average ordinary salespeople do. So welcome them with a conversation that they're already having in their head, such as, what did you come in to see and drive? Or are you coming in on our brand new, highly desirable product? Or we have 0% financing. Are you hoping to take advantage of that? And that's really an amazing one right now. If you've got 0%, that's incredible because as we see those interest rates continue to climb, zero will become a thing of the past unquestionably. And if the customer is planning on taking advantage of that, you want to do so before it ends or before you're out of product or at least get the order written so that you can secure that. If you have a summer sell down, program, if the boss is away, if you have red tag days, a private sale event or employee pricing, all of which we've, we saw disappeared through the pandemic, these event style sales and tactics, in other words, are going to come back. These are the reasons the customer calls you. These are the reasons they walk in to see you. These are the reasons they email you. So leverage that as opposed to, isn't it a lovely day? On the phone, and email is really quite similar. Read the do's and the don'ts and give me a clapping hand response this time, please. Read the do's and the don'ts on this slide and give me a clapping hand response once you've done so. One, two, three, five, six, seven, eight. Great. Thank you. This is how I know you're all paying attention or you're not, okay? You get out of this, what you put into it. So answer the phone this way, stand up. Or if you're sitting down, you don't want to stand up. You think that's going to look silly, then straighten up. Go from your slouch perspective to sit up straight. I, I say stand up 100%. Like I, I, I can't stand up any taller because I'm standing already. And then answer the phone with a smile, right? and a neutral energy level, not all excited. Be polite and skip. This is the dealership name. This is the new car, the used car department. And I am, and mention your first and last name with following up by how may I be of assistance? They know what dealer they called. They don't care who the heck you are. They're not even gonna remember it. They want your best price. That's why they're calling. They want to know whether you have the product or not. That's why they're calling. You could do something like, we're currently advertising and this one. Or you could say, are you calling on our brand new? Are you emailing in on our brand new product? Are you hoping to take advantage of 0% or no payments, no interest, no money down? Or the summer sell down, bosses away, red tag days, private sale event and employee pricing. Do you get the message? Do you see the pattern for me here? You can do exactly what you do on the phone in person with email. The secret is the pattern of repetition. And you think, oh, I feel that can become boring. You know what? Try it first. Because when you create the pattern of repetition, not only is it systemized, but it makes life a whole lot easier. And when life gets easier, you make more. So step two now, we're moving into the interview. In the showroom, while that was the greeting, by the way, that was step one. Step two is the interview. In the showroom, while walking and talking to the vehicle of their choice, or if you prefer to do the interview at your desk, ask open-ended questions. Make sure you remember from the Dynamic Buyer Odyssey how to get that dialogue started, following the Lear principle and buttoning up and not responding to everything that they say. You want to use a pen and paper or worksheet. And if you're walking and talking out on the lot, use your smartphone. If you leverage a tablet to record their contact information, excellent. The bottom line is the reason why you're pulling this stuff out is to get their, their information so that you can follow up. Don't be part of the 10%. Or well, pardon me. <laughs> don't be part of the 90% that don't follow up. Be part of the 10% that do. You could lead with something like, you know, in the event that I need to call you because this time of the month, our manufacturer announces allotment and special incentives. So if I think that I can save you money or get you the product that you really want, what's the email address that you check hourly? Or what's your cell phone number? May I text you on that? Let me go over that again. This time of the month, 
the manufacturer announces allotment and special incentives. So if I feel it is necessary to get a hold of you to save you money or get you the product that you want, what is the email address that you check hourly? And what is your cell phone number? May I text you on that? This is high priority data that you must get. Now on the phone, the process is faster. Using a pen and paper, your smartphone, tablet, or your CRM, you can record the contact information. Smiling, you can say, in the event that we are disconnected, for whatever reason, what is your cell phone number so I can call you back or I can text you? You could lead by reading the call display on your phone and ask them, is this the best number to reach you back at? You could ask them how they spell their last name, even if it's simple like Smith or Harvey. You could ask them, when is the best time to call? And your reason this time of the year, the manufacturer announces allotment and programs. Which do you prefer, text, email, or that I call you if I can save you money or the product that you are looking for is available? Now, in the learning management system, the LMS, you can print, in fact, I would encourage you, as in you must print and post these talk tracks where you will see them and use them. If you want to know about the LMS, you could go to dynamicsintel.com, that's D-Y-N-A-M-I-X-I-N-T-L.com, book a discovery call, and I'll walk you through it. I'll show you what it's all about. So if you're new in the business, I know this is wonderfully helpful. If not, this may seem a little basic, but I'm hearing more and more frustrated friends shopping for automobiles, aggravated by low inventory and long wait times, firm prices that are creating selling pressure facilitated by poor attitudes, not part of any process. Not part of any process. The interview serves as a counseling tool of inventory woes and qualification on allotment. These are the motivations for a shopper transitioning to a buyer. If you skip this step and say something ridiculous, like, yeah, we don't have any, or uh, no, no, you won't get one for six to 18 months. How is that helpful to anybody? How does that help you? How does that help the buyer? How does that help the manufacturer? How does that help anybody? It doesn't. How do you know this shopper standing in front of you calling you on the phone, emailing you, is not willing to wait. It's not news anymore. They've probably heard the horror stories of waiting six, 18, two years to get their automobile, snowmobile, ATV, UTV, side by side. Everything starts with an attitude and yours must be to serve. Use your worksheet as your interview process. Gather contact information, introduce the product, disclose the advertised price, and then gauge reaction. Analog or digital, the process and qualification is the same. Make sure you're on the right vehicle, then gauge reaction, and don't build a barrier in those first few minutes of meeting with them. They say, you know, none of that is important. You don't need my contact information. All we want to do is see it or drive it or know what our trade is worth or get your best price. If they don't want to give you the contact information, let it go. Make a friend and help them get the information that they want. Then ask for their cell phone and email later stating this time of the month, the manufacturer makes announcement. Just don't forget to get it before they leave. And then, of course, have a reason for them to give it to them to you. Give them your business card just as you're about to ask for their information because that's the law of reciprocity. It's all about timing. So the law of reciprocity works really well here. This is not, by the way, the selling concept Foursquare. This is just a matrix that I'm using to demonstrate the components of the interview that you want to follow. Offer your dealership hospitality, coffee, tea, or water, and give them your business card. Lead with a reason for you to need to call them back or email them. Now, I covered this moments ago. Ask for the best time to call and lead with an area code. Then wait for it. Wait for it. And they will fill in the next seven digits. Ask them what social media that they prefer following. Then you go make a connection after they've left 
Keep your conversations on all of these topics, light, bright, and tight at this first step of the quadrant in the interview. Don't talk about anything but the products that you sell, avoiding any kind of bad news. Now, some of us prefer to lead with the new vehicle selection, and that's perfectly fine. Then come back to the customer information. That's fine. It's cellular. Talk about the new vehicle and establish common ground. Then get personal information before or afterwards. The new vehicle information is a light conversation of trim, features, colors, first and second and third choice on all of those things. And what the customer's expectations are. Meaning, if they want this vehicle for a wedding or for hunting season or for next week to go away snowmobiling, well, you gotta address that timing if that is an issue. And it is, quite frankly, it's still an issue. If they are not in a rush, you can control how long you need to work with them so that you can get on to another shopper to convert them to a buyer. The interview step determines your success. Now, trade-ins for many of us can be challenging. Don't appear too eager to take a trade-in. And of course, don't blah, puke information about the state of affairs of trade-in, whether the U.S. is paying lots for them or new car prices have gone up so much that you can pay a lot of money for the vehicle. Take a breath when it comes to taking the trade-in. Step back. Your car proof or your walk around may determine that this is not actually a vehicle that you're excited about taking on trade, especially if, if it is not in good condition. In this market, when trade-in values are high, you're a hero. And of course, when the market cycles and the values settle, as we're starting to see a little bit happen, you're not. What you need to know is if the buyer, pardon me, the shopper is ready to deal right now and be convert to becoming a buyer. If the answer is now, take their keys, registration, title and papers to your appraiser. If not, as in not now, not ready to buy, then tell them that we'll have a look at it and address the trade-in when the time comes. In either case, let's make the best use of our time and sell the right product. Now, price, this is an easy one to address. And again, like the trade-in, something average ordinary salespeople shy away from. Certainly with our supply and demand in your favor right now, never has scarcity and urgency been so relevant and prevalent. With a trade-in, until you factor in the lean payout, there's really no way to know exactly what the new payments are going to be. And of course, if you don't have the new product on the ground and you're going to have to wait a week, a month, six months, then we're going to appraise that vehicle that time. Only ever present in this quadrant of price your advertisement. Just only ever quote the advertisement. The advertisement might have money down. The advertisement might be 0%. If your financing division won't guarantee 0% till the product arrives, then you have to share with them, right now it is, is that affordable, gauge reaction, and say, for the same payment as you have now, taking your vehicle in on trade, paying off the loan, and driving home in a fully protected payment, if it were only slightly more on the new vehicle, is this the right one for you? Verify that. Verify and get commitment qualifying with just slightly more. Don't hesitate and go too long with your presentation getting into the next step. Give me a thumbs up, click on the reactions that you can do this. I wanna make sure that it's making sense to you. Give me a thumbs up, thank you. Give me a thumbs up, three, four, five. Give me a clapping hands, excellent. Six, seven, eight, great, thank you. Hey, look, you get out of this what you put into it, right? So I really hope you're getting the message. The eight steps to success are not complicated. Even better, they're not time consuming. It's simply a map for you to follow with every shopper to convert them every time. 
Follow-up is not linear, as mentioned earlier. It happens at any step the shopper leaves, including when the shopper converts, like forever. Follow-up happens forever. That's what you need to focus on more than anything, your follow-up, because it's forever. And that's what creates a pipeline for you. This is why I use the cellular diagram as opposed to a linear list. The linear process on the left looks so much more complicated and convoluted and cumbersome. Same number of steps, just in my opinion, poorly organized. So let's move on to step three, the product walk around then. Now the interview serves another purpose. The interview is the hub of your eight step process. And we leverage this three spoke process, these three tactics of overview, benefit and permission to ensure you have shopper commitment. Your shopper will see themselves getting what they want and in return, you see yourself getting what you want, a sale and commission. Throughout the sales process, seek commitment with readiness. Don't oversell yourself by talking too much. When you talk too much and you oversell yourself and you really enjoy hearing yourself talk, you miss buying clues, a common mistake of average ordinary salespeople. Without a system to follow, those average ordinary salespeople misinter misinterpret, pardon me, a customer's politeness as being interested in hearing them talk. And that is not the case. You will do three of these OBT tactics before transitioning to the next step of three, four, five, and six. Let me show you. When there is only one vehicle to present, if you even have that, and you're doing so for a commitment to order, your presentation can get a little rusty. The walk around is just as dynamic as the eight step roadmap. Meaning, if the shopper wants to start at the back of the vehicle, start there. Walk around the vehicle, naming features, selling benefits, and showing functionality. The walk around is six positions. Now, for me, I start at the front of the vehicle with each step reviewing the OBT, overview, benefit, and permission, OBP, pardon me, OBP, like this. The overview is what I'd like to do with you is the benefit. This will help you see. And the permission I ask for is, may I do so? OBP makes the customer feel like they are in charge and in control, and that's customer focused. So the first position is what I call the photographer's 45. This position showcases the silhouette, smooth lines, hidden safety bumper, arrow shutters, grill, jeweled headlight module, fog lights, air dam, styling crimps, arrow wipers, rain water management, and high luster protective paint. That's a data dump. Don't ever do that. Follow my FFB presentation of feature, function, and benefit to convert shoppers to buyers every time. What you need to do right now is select 10 features per position change for each one of the products that you sell to highly and effectively bridge what the new vehicle will do for them over what their old vehicle is not doing. And more on this in presentation secrets. At the end of each position, you want to follow up with do you like it? Now, the second position is the engine compartment. And this is an exciting one for some people and not so exciting for others. The enthusiast loves this. The power buyer, <laughs> they don't want anything to do with it. Horsepower and torque values are easy data points. Clear reservoirs, crumple zones, non-intrusive deck lid hinge, warranty, roadside assistance, multi-speed or constant velocity transmissions and driving dynamics. Don't ever do that. Don't ever let me come into your showroom and hear you just blah, puke those features without following up with a feature function benefit presentation. Don't ever do that. Customers don't enjoy it. Yeah, you think you look so intelligent, rambling through so fast. The benefits are components that isolate noise, vibration, and harshness, making the driving experience enjoyable. Every one of those benefits fit in under the hood. Bridge, again, what their old car is doing, rattling, shaking, vibrating, noisy with what the new car will do for them. Smooth ride, quiet, no problems, start every time. 
full warranty coverage. Always be thinking of that transformation from what they're not getting now to what they're going to get. That's the bridge. You form the bridge. I love using that metaphor. I hope you get it. Always be thinking of transformation. And then, of course, finish off this position change with, is there anything in question under the hood that you'd like me to address? On the passenger side of the vehicle, now you're going to draw their attention to remote control mirrors that are heated, 16, 17, 18, and, 20, and 19 and 20 inch aluminum wheels, sunscreen glass, uh, front and rear seatbelt pretensioners, passenger side airbags, occupant detection, seat sensors, side impact guard beam, side impact seat mounted airbags, window curtain airbags, child security rear door locks, splash guards, passenger safety, fuel access, and you say at the end of all of that, anything in question. Now again, don't ever do that. It's a data dump, right? You're probably sitting there going, Bill, you're going too fast. I can't write this all, all this stuff down. I don't want you to write it down. It would be ridiculous for you to write it down because you've got to take the time, slow yourself down, name the feature, sell the function, and then talk about the benefit. At the back of the vehicle, in other words, at the trunk, we want to identify the, again, the silhouette that we may have talked about at the front of the vehicle, that low coefficient of drag that achieves better fuel economy, as well as distinctive styling. And of course, the features that you could talk about, and I'll quickly go through them once again, wraparound bumper cover, spoilers, rear windshield washer, defroster combination, park assist, rear view backup camera, trailer park assist and bird's eye view, foot operated power tailgate, trailer hitch, dual exhaust, high polish outlets, rear fog lamps, and there's a ton more there. Don't ever do that data dump. In the learning management system, I give you the full feature with the function of each one of the benefits to these features, and that's in the presentation secrets. If you want more about that, about the brand new Automotive Sales Academy system, go to dynamicsintel.com and book a discovery call. I'm happy to take you through a full demo on it. Just got there we go. Inside the cargo area, you, you can talk about the power tailgate or lift gate, the D-rings, cargo restraints, compact spare and inflator system. You get the idea. I'm just going to blast off a bunch of features here. Unique purposeful storage con compartments, security cargo cover, illuminated cargo area, safety lights on the tailgate, two-tier tailgate, flexible load carrying, locking tailgate and tonneau cover, step bumper, and most importantly, after you've done your feature function benefit, not that data dump, you want to ask them, folks, is there anything else? Is there anything that you will be doing specifically with your new car, truck, SUV, ATV, UTV, side-by-side, -side, or snowmobile as soon as you get it? Is there anything really, really special that you'll be doing with it? You want to keep them engaged and get them to see themselves enjoying the product. That way you'll see they're committed and you see yourself getting the sale and the commission. On the driver's side, point out six, eight, 10, 12, or 14 airbags being dual dash, knee bolster, seat mounted, side impact, outboard, inside, and now outside seat airbag protection. The luxury brand manufacturers have both inside and outside airbag side seat mounted protection, rear seat side impact and window curtain airbags, front seatbelt pretensioners, anti-submarining seats, adjustable power foot pedals, whiplash, head restraint system, heated steering wheel, air conditioned seats, infotainment system of Apple and Android, Google with tri-zone climate control and greenhouse compensation, including pollen and particulate cabin air filter, air exchange system. Again, that's a data dump. Purely for the purpose of demonstration here, you would never do that with a customer, even if you slowed it down. Don't just simply mention whiplash head restraints, heated steering wheel. Talk about the feature, pardon me, name the feature, sell the function, and then talk about the benefit. That is how you bridge from their old car to the new car every time. And then, of course, we need to check in on the commitment with, 
If you don't have any questions, what I'd like to do at this point is to take you on an evaluation drive and get your impressions of it. Of course, that hinges right now on availability. But the point is, we're transitioning to that demonstration drive. I hope you're really getting that. And with that, gang, we are out of time. And it's perfect timing to stop because we're moving now into that next step. Now, if you really want to get the most out of the time that we spend together, go to Sales Gladiator Private Members Facebook group and now our brand new Automotive Sales Academy on Instagram. And it's the Automotive Sales Academy, all one word, on Instagram. And follow me there. What you're going to see is the Gladiator starts to become the challenge. If you're struggling, frustrated, annoyed with your job and so on, the, the Gladiator challenge is the thing for you. If you just want to learn these skills and tactics and hone your acumen further, the Automotive Sales Academy is the place for you. They're two very separate presentation demonstration styles. Now, I've got as much time as all of you have for questions. Text me in your question. Lots of time to do so. I know I'm going now, you may be getting the feeling we're slowing this down, trying to get you more engaged. I'm not so worried about the half an hour time frame anymore. If you don't have enough time and you've got to get to that sales meeting, get to a customer out on the showroom floor, respond to an email, call a customer up that you just thought about because we talked about the follow-up. I get it. Go ahead, excuse yourself from the meeting. But if you've got a question, text it in. Take this time. You've got me as your personal coach right now. No question's a silly question. All questions are excellent. Type it into everyone so everybody can see it. And you've got me till the end. Thanks, Rebecca. Same to you. Anybody else have a question? Have a comment? Anybody, anybody thinking of something that is, that is slowing them down, challenging them? I think for... For a couple of you, I know at your particular Ford dealership, you've got a sales meeting that probably has started. So you may have already excused yourself, and I get that. Does anybody have a comment or question? The, the, the problem with a process, and let me preface it with that, the problem. Most average ordinary salespeople don't follow a process. For the simple fact that it's an adherence to a way of doing something, quite simply. It's that strict adherence to a way of doing something. And they see it as a rule. They see it as a confinement. They see it as routine, regimented. And what's so wrong with that? That's what fascinates me is... When we know exactly what we're supposed to do and we rehearse it to perfection, we actually enjoy what we're doing. We enjoy it immensely. We enjoy it with, with magnificent fulfillment and, and accomplishment. And yet I can't tell you how often I'm challenged with, yeah, I have a bill, you know, do I, do I really need to follow the system? Is that really what customers are looking for? Will they feel like they're ju just being treated like, like an object as opposed to being treated like a, an individual? And my answer is always the same. Yes, absolutely. Because the system works so well by being tested and refined over decades with thousands of students that it's efficient. Look, the number one concern for well over two decades that, a con that consumers have is it takes too long to purchase a vehicle in the showroom. I really believe that it's one of the driving forces behind virtual presentations and sales. The customer doesn't want to come in and spend an afternoon with us. And yet, that's exactly what happens. When we have our process refined, perfectly refined, such that it doesn't take any thought to go on to the next step. The, your presentation could be three hours long, but the customer doesn't feel like it's three hours because they're having such a great time with you. And there's always something more to do in the next step. And they're learning about the product that they would like to buy. Look, unquestionably, they spend a lot of time shopping online. 
So Google tells us at least six months. They also tell us that this the shopping process could be as much as two years out. Well, there's no amount of research that any shopper, correct me if I'm wrong, no amount of research any shopper could do to create the emotions of rushing out to buy the product without going out and seeing it, touching it, and feeling it. If that were the case, I think people would buy their cars from different continents, let alone different states, provinces, or countries. They'd go to wherever it was cheapest and have it delivered to them. With certain products, that, is, that could be true. With the products that we sell, that is the farthest thing from the truth. What we want to do, what you need to do, is make sure you create that excitement, that enthusiasm, that I can't live with out it feeling and then your shoppers convert to buyers each and every time okay i don't see any more questions coming in or i don't say i don't have any questions for today so with that i'm going to give uh, gift you the gift of time to go out there and start working with customers thank you everyone for joining me and i look forward to seeing you again next thursday at 10 a.m for these weekly webinars have a wonderful day amazing weekend as we go into the end of the month. I hope it's shaping up magnificently for you. By the way, happy fall day. It is the first day of fall. We'll talk to you again real soon. Bye-bye for now.